Welcome to the course on call options. My name is Harry Swaminathan. I'm the founder of OptionTiger.com, which is a comprehensive options trading and education website. I have a bachelor's degree in engineering from India and an MBA from Columbia Business School in New York. In this course, we are going to study the details of call options. If you don't know anything about options, then this is the right place to start. And call options are, for some reason, much more simpler to understand than put options. That's probably because call options is just like buying stock. When you buy a stock, you expect the price to go up and you can sell your stock for a much higher price than what you bought it for. It's the same case with call options. So a call option is a bullish instrument, whereas a put option is a bearish instrument. So when you buy a call option, you expect or you want the price to go up so that you can sell it for a much higher price than what you bought it for. So this is the course agenda. And we're going to start with a brief history of how options came about. Then we're going to look at some of the main differences between stocks and options. And you'll see that there are plenty of differences. In fact, it's a completely different instrument altogether. Then we'll get into the definition of options and what a call option in particular is. This is an area where newcomers are going to struggle with a little bit because these definitions are not very intuitive. But you need to stick with the definitions and once we go into the next uh, few slides, we're going to look at what a real world example of a call option looks like. And at that point, you'll be absolutely clear what a call option is. We're also going to look at what factors impact option prices. And this is a big difference between options and stock. In stock, there's only one factor and that's the price. If the price of the stock goes up, then if your position is going to make a profit. If the price of your stock goes down, you're going to make a loss. Whereas in options, it's not that straightforward. So we're going to look at what an option is and what factors impact option prices. Now, just like in stocks, you have a buyer and you have a seller, even with options. So we're going to look at the differences between a buyer and a seller. And these are very different from stocks as well. The buyer and the seller, although they have opposite positions, they have a very different set of rights and obligations. Then once we've looked at the real world example of what a call option looks like, we are going to play a few scenarios on that real world example. So the real world example is that of a real estate deal. So let's say you or me were going to buy a house, but you needed some time. So you bought an option on that on that house to put a hold on the price. And so on this real estate deal, we are going to change a couple of things and we are going to play about three different scenarios so that you understand what at the money options are, what out of the money options are, and what in the money options are. Then we're going to look at the risk and reward in a call option. We are also going to look, take a detailed look at what the buyer's profile and the seller's profile looks like from a risk and reward perspective. And then finally, we are going to go into the trading platform and we are going to look at Apple options in detail. In particular, what we are going to be looking for is to play out these three different scenarios that we looked at in the real example. So what we'll do is just like we did in the real estate example, we are going to take the same scenarios and look at how those options are represented on an actual trading platform with a real stock. And, and the stock we are going to use is Apple. So this is the course agenda. Obviously, there's going to be various uh, sections and lectures to it. And by the end of this course, you should have a very good idea of what call options work. And that's because we are going to use a real world example 
Uh, one of the big problems for newcomers to understand options is that people start explaining it in terms of the strike prices and you know, all kinds of complicated uh, definitions. And that's not the real way to learn what options are. So in both the case of a call option as well as a put option, we are going to use real world examples that everybody can relate to. So, you know, whether it's a piece of real estate or whether we are buying insurance on our house or our car, these are the kinds of examples we are going to use in this course as well as the course on put options so that you can clearly relate to what an option is and how you can think about options. Because at a fundamental level, it's critical that you understand the concept of an option. And to really understand that, you have to relate it to the real world. So that's as far as the agenda is concerned. Let's take a brief look at how options came about. So the first known use of options was in Greece a very long time ago, around 300 BC. So the story is there was an olive speculator who had a pretty good hunch that in the upcoming olive harvest season, it was going to be a very good one. So he, he had a hunch that in the next few months, whenever the olive harvest came about, it was going to be a very good one. But he didn't have, he was not an olive farmer. He didn't have any farms of his own. So what he did was he went around to all the olive farmers in that area and he struck up contracts with them and he, and he guaranteed them a certain price and that price was perfectly acceptable to the olive farmers. In fact, it was good for them because they were guaranteed a price that was equal to or better than your average uh, olive season. So the farmers thought it was a good deal and they went in for those contracts. And sure enough, when the olive harvest season came along, this speculator was right and the olive season was a spectacular harvest and so he had contracts to buy the, all these olives from these farmers at a certain price but he was able to go out in the market and he was able to get a much better price because the product was good and uh, everybody wanted olives that uh, that year so he made a huge profit on this particular contract. So this was the first known use of options uh, way back in 300 BC. Since then, there have been several uses, although these are not documented very clearly, but we know that options were used in the tulip bubble in the Netherlands in the 1600s. And then in England, there was also an attempt to use option-like instruments uh, associated with corporate uh, entities and companies. And then in the US, futures markets developed in the 19th century. And of course, in 1973, that was the first time when call options started trading on the CBOE. And these options were based on what you call the Black-Scholes pricing model. Black and Scholes were two mathematicians uh, who came up with this options pricing model. And then we had put options that began trading in 1977. And then by 1990, you had options traded on several securities. Today, we have options on hundreds of securities, commodities like gold, silver, oil, currencies like the euro, the US dollar, and, and uh, hundreds of stocks and indices as well. So options have become a very popular instrument in the last 20 years. The mathematicians Black and Scholes were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1997 for their Black-Scholes options pricing model. As you can imagine, if we had mathematicians who came up with the model, that should tell you that options are a purely mathematical concept only. So it's worth repeating this again. Options are a purely mathematical concept. These options are based on a certain underlying asset. The underlying asset could be a stock, it could be a currency, it could be a commodity, it could be real estate, it can be anything. So there are two different instruments here. The option is one instrument and the stock or the underlying asset is another instrument. So there are two different markets also. 
So the options market is very separate and very different from the stock market. If there was no underlying asset, then there cannot be any options. So that's you know the first thing you need to understand. In terms of stock or shares, you're owning a certain percentage of a company, you're eligible for its profits and things like that. With options, there's nothing like that. If there was no underlying asset, then there would be no options. And secondly, this is the important thing. The underlying asset must have some kind of price uncertainty associated with it. That is, the prices of this asset must be volatile to some extent. You can define volatility as uh, uh, in many ways, but basically the prices should be uncertain. So whether it's the price of corn, whether it's the price of soybean, or the price of the US dollar, or the price of a stock, as long as the prices of this underlying asset is moving, that's when you can create an option on that particular asset. And this is precisely why options are called derivatives, because their prices are derived from the price of this underlying asset. Options were created to provide flexibility with price for buyers and sellers. So buyers and sellers of certain products, certain underlying assets, could be corn, could be olives, could be anything, buyers and sellers had different needs to position themselves with respect to uncertainty in the future. So the future could be one month, it could be six months, it could be one year. And so to either protect themselves or hedge themselves, they created these instruments called options. And options obviously then has to have an expiry date. In the case of the olive farmer, the expiry date was a few months, depending upon when the olive harvest was. In the case of stocks, you're going to, have, you're going to see expiry of option contracts on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis. And you're also going to see long-term options, which are called leaps. These long-term options run from anywhere from one year to two years or more. In the US markets, an option contract is equivalent to 100 shares. And this standardization is very important and it's, and it's required so that all these contracts can be settled in a uniform manner when the date of expiry comes along. In the US, Options expire every third Friday of every month. And this applies to the monthly options. As we said, there are weekly options that expire every Friday at the close of uh, the market hours. We also have quarterly options that expire on the last day of March, June, September, and December. And leap options vary. You have leap options for one to two years. Uh, and their expiry date will also be specified. So that's as far as a history about options. And this history applies to both call options as well as put options. Since this is the first introductory course, it's important to get a lay of the land about how options are structured in the US markets or any markets. Now, different countries might have different expiry dates. They, there might be some other subtle differences which we can get to in later courses, but fundamentally, this is how an option market is created and this is how options are traded across the world. We'll now move into what a call option is, how an option is defined, and then how a call option is defined, and then we'll look into a real-world example of call options.